Good morning. <laughs> Boy, last week was amazing, wasn't it? Uh, God did something here in an, in an incredible way last week. If, if you weren't here, I, I'm sorry, but it was, it was awesome. We started this new series called Igniting Prayer, and I think that's exactly what God did. I think God started igniting prayer in our hearts as a church last week. And uh, I started getting all these great messages from people about what God was doing. I think the thing that excited me most about last week was the people that came up to me afterwards and said, Pastor Jim, God's been speaking this message into my heart for the last weeks and months. It didn't start today for me. It's been something that God's been talking to me about. I've sensed this desire for prayer, this hunger. I've sensed this take going deeper in prayer that not just for me, but for our church. And so when I hear stuff like that, I know it's not about, it's not about me. It's not about our, our Sunday service. It's about God moving. And that's what we want to be a part of. Because, you know, we can sing and we can have church and I can preach, but I can't light a fire. God is the one that lights the fire. And uh, th that's, that's his domain. But we did say last week that we can light a match. We can't create fire, but we can light a match. And prayer is the match that sets God on fire, you know, sets, brings his fire amongst his people. And so that's why he calls us to pray. And that's why he's been working in us and moving in us. And I think God wants to do something in us because I believe God wants to do something through us. You guys, God loves this world. He loves your neighbors. He loves the people that you work with like crazy. And while God loves his church, his heart is, is, is broken for the, the people who are still living in rebellion, the people who are still ignoring him. And he's calling us. And he's filling us and he wants to set us on fire, not for ourselves or for our church, but for the world. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And so he's igniting this prayer in us. And this past week, I've heard so many cool stories about people praying together and I heard stories about people gathering and just kind of spontaneously praying here and, and praying there and, and people getting together, you know, as, as you know, our staff you know, our staff was praying here in this, this room and, and other rooms throughout our church, just praying that God would, would stir us, ignite in us, and, and work in us His will and His purpose. And, and, I, and I, think, I think He's doing that. And this, this all comes around this whole language of, Lord, I asked you last week, those of you here, to pray with me. Lord, teach us to pray. Five words. Yeah, five. There's not four, five. Five words. Same with me. Lord, Teach us to pray. And I challenged you, if you were here last week, so let me challenge you today. Would you pray those five words over the next month? See what God does. J just, and you can pray other things, but especially those five words. Lord, teach us to pray. And see what God does. And as he begins to answer that prayer, don't stop. Keep praying. As he begins to answer that prayer, because that prayer is going to take us deeper and deeper and deeper into God's heart. He's going to do more and more through us as we learn. Because there's so much more to learn than what we can learn in just a couple of weeks or a couple of months. In fact, we'll never get to the place, friends, where we've learned everything there is to know about prayer. And so last week I was all spitting and shouting and hollering and casting vision for why we need to pray. Today, I want to, you know, look more deeply into these words, Lord, teach us to pray, and, and begin to answer the question of what does it look like when God teaches us to pray? So turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, and that's where these words come from, by the way. The five words, Lord, teach us to pray, come from this passage in Luke chapter 11, where one day Jesus is praying, Okay? So if you've got your Bibles open, let's stand to our feet, all of us, and um, we'll read the first four verses of, of Luke chapter 11. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, here's these words, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus said to them, 
When you pray, say, and I, I pointed out earlier, earlier crowd, that in the Greek, Jesus uses a text, a tense here that says, when you pray, keep saying these things. Don't, it's not just a one-time prayer. This is keep saying this. So when you pray, be saying, keep saying, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You know, we're ready for the next phrase, right? Your will be done. <laughs> it's not in Luke's version. That's in Matthew's version. How will be your name? Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Okay, you may be seated. If you were wondering where's the rest of the prayer, there's two versions of what we call the Lord's Prayer here in Luke and then in Matthew. And we'll talk about Matthews in a couple of seconds. The thing I want you to notice here is that is why Jesus teaches this prayer. And it's an answer, you notice in verse 1, it's an answer to this disciple. We don't know who this disciple is. Seeing Jesus pray, and he's watching him, and he's like, man, I, I want to pray like that. And I don't know whether, you know, this is Peter and the disciples sent him because, you know, don't interrupt Jesus when he's praying. Or there's just Peter himself. We, we don't really know. It's an unnamed person. But he's, he's saying, I, I want to learn to pray like that. And furthermore, it's not just pray like that. But, you know, we're in the middle of the, ma of the gospel of Luke. And we've seen Jesus pray. And all of a sudden, bread and fish are multiplied. It turns into a real happy meal. We see Jesus pray. And demons are cast out. We see Jesus pray, and people are healed of blindness and are raised from the dead. I mean, there's power in the way that Jesus prays. It was not just the words that he said. It was the, the power that he prayed with, and it was something about the way he prayed, and the disciples were like, man, I want to I pray like that. I want to learn to pray. And we said last week, you know, can you pray fire down? Do you know how to pray in such a way that heaven and earth are moved do you know how to pray in such a way that, that lives are changed? When Jesus prayed, things happened. And while all of us know how to say prayer words, I believe God wants to take us someplace. I believe God wants to do something in us where our prayers are full of his power. And as we said last week, we pray and God answers with fire. Maybe not literal fire, you know, and, you know, coming down, but, but God, God moves on us. God works in us in such a way that it's unmistakable. And it's not just words that are being said. And, and while I say that, um, I got to help you understand that the words are not where the power is. It's not the, the words that Jesus says. It's the relationship that he has. And that's what the disciples see. They see the power. They see the relationship. And they're like, we want to pray like that. So I highlighted in yellow, Lord, teach us to have that kind of relationship. Teach us how to pray. And when a disciple, that's a follower of Jesus, right? A disciple sees Jesus. He says, I, that's the way I want to be like that. So you can actually write down, learning to pray like Jesus will make us more like Jesus. You know how we say in this church that a disciple... Three things. This is not in your notes, but if you want to write this down, you can. A disciple is one who's following Jesus to learn from Jesus in order to become like Jesus. You're not a disciple if you're just following from a distance. You're not a disciple if you're just following for the show. You follow to learn. But you're not a disciple if you're just learning some things here and there. That learning, that following, that learning leads you to become. So a disciple is one who's following Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to become like Jesus. And that is what Jesus is, is calling us to. As a church, we talk about we want to be more like Christ. We want to follow him, to learn from him, to become more like him. Friends, praying. Especially learning to pray like Jesus. Praying will help you become more like him. And that's what I, I want to teach us this morning is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And as you pray like this, as you learn the, the heart, the point of the prayer that Jesus teaches the disciples, you will become more and more like Christ. And, and this... this, this um, this thing that this disciple saw in Jesus that he wanted you'll begin to see happening in your life. So the first thing that I want you to see in this text about 
what Jesus prays is the first word. And we're going to just stop for a second and look at this word I have highlighted on the screen in yellow. Father. It's just one word, but it's, it's a huge, um, significant way to start the prayer. Partly because um, Jesus started his prayer so much different than how any, anybody else prayed in his day. Um, the Jews had written down prayers for all different kinds of occasions. The, the Jews are and were a praying people. And so as the rabbis and as the priests tried to teach people how to pray, they, they wrote out all these prayers. And the vast majority of the prayers, prayers started off like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaAkam, which means blessed are you, Lord God. Blessed are you, our Lord God, um, King of the universe, King of creation. And then they would go on with some more appellations about who God was. And that's, that's how all these prayers started. And then Jesus comes saying, start like this. Father. It's, you're kind of leaning forward. You know, where's the, where's the rest of it? You know, where's the, the, the praise and where, where's the, the on and on and on? It's just Father. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's giving us a window into his relationship with God, the Father, which is where all the power comes from. i got to repeat this. We, I think sometimes we think, and I sometimes think that, that some of the Jews thought that if they, they get the right words right, if you, you know, if, you, if you say for our fathers, and if you get the words just right, then God's like obligated because you said the right words, you know, open sesame, and so people sometimes study this prayer just to get the words right, say it just right, because so, then God has to, to do what you asked him. Then he's like he's chained, he's obligated to answer your prayer. But it's not in the words, it's not in the technique. The power of Jesus is in the relationship. And he's got this relationship with God that's a father-son relationship. And there's so much meaning in that. And in this father-son relationship that is so intimate and so close to Jesus, love is just pouring between Jesus to his father and between the father to the son. You know how many times it says in the Gospels that all of a sudden the heavens broke open and God spoke and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You know, I love him. There is this, the heavens opening, you see love just pouring back and forth. Friends, this, this is what Jesus is inviting us into. This, as we learn to pray like Jesus, it'll open up this love relationship. And you'll discover that learning to pray like Jesus helps you love God. It, it ignites love for God. It, it births in it. And that's why it's important that we start the prayer like Jesus with these, this word. Father. Now, after you've written down the point, um, let me talk to you about a second about why it's so important that you view God as Father. Um, I'm going to put something on the screen that's not in your notes, but I would invite you to write it down. How you view God dictates, determines whether you will pray, and if you do pray, how you pray. Your perception of God is everything. This is one of the things that Jesus is opening us to us so, in such an awesome way. This is what he's igniting in us as we learn to pray like Jesus, is this relationship. He viewed God not as this, you know, distant, detached deity, the way some people do. Some people view God as this genie, you know, that if you, you know, like I said, you say the right words, you know, open sesame, Jesus, you know, is obligated to, or God is obligated to come and answer your prayer. Or some people view God as an angry judge. I'm not going to show, ask for a show of hands, but it's, it, it, it alarms me how many people I talk to and I'm realizing, oh, I, oh my goodness, you don't, your view of God is all twisted. It's so distorted. No wonder you don't want to talk to God. No wonder you don't love God. You don't know him. You don't know what he's like. You don't know the father heart of God. Might want to just take a second and ask God to reveal to you, Lord, what's my view of you? Do I see you as, as a loving father? Or am, or am I afraid of you? Is there, is there anger? Is there resentment? Because if you, if you see God as an angry judge, you're going to be cowering before him, if you even come at all. 
You know, you're, I don't want to come to that bench and have him knock that, you know, that gavel down. I'm afraid. Or if you see him like a genie, you know, you're going to be working on the technique. And if you see, and it's all this superstition. A lot of people's prayers are more superstition than they are relationship. If you see God as, you know, this um, distant, detached deity, then you spend all your time trying to get God's attention. Jesus just says, Father, because he knows that God the Father is attentive. He, he's... He's so attentive to, to he, he, he's a doting father. And, and so as we learn to see God as a loving father, it develops into this intimate relationship. And this is why the word father is so significant. Jesus wants his disciples to, to understand I'm here on this earth to show you how to live in an intimate relationship with God the Father. And it starts with the, the prayers, the very words that I am giving you to pray. And I, Jesus is like, I want everyone to have the intimacy that I have with God. I want everyone to have this personal, vibrant, vital relationship with God that, that I have, this father-son, father-daughter relationship. And, and when, you, when you see him, Jesus says, like I see him, then there's this, there's this trusting dependence. I'm not trying to get your attention and say, oh God, you know, hey, are you, are you paying attention? I'm not trying to, to con you or convince you. I, I, I trust you. This is all in this word, Father. This is, um, you know, I, I don't ever, ever remember as a kid coming home from school or coming home from work or waking up in the morning and going, man, I hope my dad paid the, the light bill so we can turn on the lights today. I hope, I hope dad paid the mortgage, you know, this month so we don't get kicked out. You know, I hope that there's food. I, don't, I never, ever remember any in my life wondering if, if my dad was going to take care of us. I just trusted I depended on him I know some of you are like yo so that's fine for you Jim I can see why you understand this relationship with God the Father because you had a great dad and I did but he wasn't perfect but he was great but I know some of you are like I don't have a dad like that so I I don't get this when I say father it does it's not warm fuzzies you know it's not it's not hey I'm attracted to that it's just the opposite some of you you hate your dad's some of you are so angry. And there's a roadblock here. So I, I just pause right now to ask, ask you, Father, that would you open our hearts to who you are. I want God's character as revealed in the, Bobby, in the Bible to shape what you think about God versus your father here on earth. God designed it so that fathers model and that fathers give their children a taste of what the Heavenly Father is, but we're all imperfect. But even if you had an awesome dad, God the Father is a, you know, a million, billion times better. So with that in mind, even if you had a bad father, God is still a million, billion times better. Um, so, so if you did have a bad father, and you don't get this whole father thing, then, then just say, Lord, teach me. Since you're asking, teach us how to pray. Teach me the, the, the Father's heart. That's a, that's a huge prayer. Teach me what you're really like from your word, God. And help me, help me to lay aside all of the imperfect, lay beside, aside all the distortion, all the caricatures of who you are. God, teach me your heart. Help me to see you the way Jesus saw you as a father. And as you, as you do that, as you go deeper in that, things will begin to open up for you. Now, I know as soon as I say that, some of you are like uncomfortable with that whole idea of being really ultra familiar with God. And you want people to remember that God's holy. Well, that's the next thing Jesus does. Look at your text. In the very next words, hallowed be your name. You understand what that word means? Hallowed? <laughs> um, it means holy. That's what that word means. It means uh, be holy. 
It means be uh, holified, you might say like that. So in, you know, in John chapter uh, 17, Jesus actually calls God Father several times. And then one time he calls him Holy Father. And this is what I want to invite some of you to do. If you've got a bad relationship with your dad and you can't bear saying, talking to God and calling him Father, then call him Holy Father. Do what Jesus did in John 17. Call him Holy Father or, or Heavenly Father. The Matthew's version of the prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, our Heavenly Father. Call him that to distinguish him from your own earthly father. And learn the, the, the balance between this idea of the fatherhood of God and this hallowed nature of God. The, I'll put that on the screen since the, the word doesn't exist. The holified, you know, the holy. That's what that word is, the holy nature. I like the New Living Translation. May your name be kept holy. So there's this beautiful a balance between seeing God as Father and seeing God as holy. And oh, do we need this today? Because sometimes I hear people pray and I get the idea that, that God's like a big friend, you know, that God's just kind of this, this, um, this, this genie friend that I have, you know, this guy in the closet. And, and there's, just so, there's such familiarity, it's almost trivial, friends. God is not as someone to be trivialized. He is not to be tri trifled with. God is holy. He's also Father. This is a beautiful balance. Jesus, as usual, teaches us the balance. Never forget that God's a holy God. And that you should come with, to him with reverent respect. Don't let the intimacy of coming before Abba, Father, and crawling up on his lap turn into familiarity that breeds contempt. Nurture that intimacy. Nurture that closeness. But never forget, this Father is the Holy One of Israel. This Father is the King of the universe. This Father is so, he is a consuming fire. When you look in Scripture and you see people who trivialize, domesticated, um, marginalize God. God's like, whoa, 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 careful there. That's, that's, that's not who I am. I'm the Holy One. Approach Him with, with holy respect, with reverent respect. And when you see uh, places in the Bible where people, where God kind of opens up, shows up. Remember how we talked about the fire last week? One of the places I didn't talk about was as Isaiah chapter 6. There's all kinds of fire in that passage. When Isaiah, you know, sees God blazing, he, and here's the angels crying out, holy, 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 not father, 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 holy, holy, holy. Remember what Isaiah does? He's like, he's like, whoa, whoa is me. The holiness of God revealed his sin. And there's this intimacy, and yet there's this, this respect, this awe-struck worship of the living God. This, this is what Jesus draws us into, this intimate relationship that's wrapped in this awestruck worship and this, this reverent respect. Don't you love what Jesus is teaching us? And all this is in the word, Father, hallowed be your name. Every word Jesus utters in this prayer that he's teaching it's, it's so full, so rich. And some of you who know that I'm a wordy preacher, you know I could preach for months on just these phrases. But I don't have months. I've got a couple more minutes. So let's move on past this phrase of Father with all we've learned and hallowed, holy be your name. Let's move to the very next phrase. See it there. You got your Bible open, right? Your kingdom come. Three words. Your kingdom come. And most students of the Bible realize the significance of the word kingdom. And there's all kinds of meaning there, but it might be that the most significant word in that three-word phrase is the word your. Here's why. Most humans turn prayer into a what I want, me, my. We turn prayer into a, a, one of the most selfish things we do. Now, I need to be careful here. There's nothing wrong with using the word I, me, and mine in your prayers. Just don't turn your prayers into such self-centeredness that it becomes narcissistic. And it's interesting to me, if you look at this text, 
Luke 11 as well as Matthew 6, there's not one I, there's not one me, there's not one mine, there's not one my uh, in the whole prayer that Jesus, the model prayer Jesus teaches. Instead, it's focused on God, and we'll talk more about later what, el- el- what else happens, but here's what Jesus is doing. I-, I want you to recognize that in prayer is where you get your heart calibrated. It's where you get your priorities recentered. That it's not about you and your kingdom. Let me put it this way. It's not about me and my kingdom. It's about you, God, your kingdom. So right away, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. I want your agenda. I want your kingdom. Now, kingdom is a leadership word. We don't want to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ because we want to be the kings and queens of our own kingdom. This is what every human being wrestles with. It doesn't matter whether you go to church. That's not the important thing. Well, it's important to go to church, but that's not what saves you. It's not, it doesn't matter how much money you give. It matters. Have you surrendered the kingdoms of your heart to the king of the universe? And a lot of religious people haven't. The prayer they pray in church or at home is, my kingdom come. I want a God that will help my kingdom come. My will be done. Why do we pray like that? Because we're sinners through and through. And so Jesus shapes our prayer by teaching us to pray, your kingdom come. And as Matthew adds, your will be done. Remember Jesus the night before he died in the Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will, but yours be done. This isn't the first time Jesus has prayed this. Jesus lived this prayer of not my will, but yours be done. We call it living surrendered. So secondly, learning to pray like Jesus helps us learn how to live surrendered. And this prayer that Jesus prays, your kingdom come, your will be done, is something that has to start in our heart. The kingdom of God comes to our heart and changes us from the inside out. So we surrender our heart to God's loving leadership. This is what I'm calling you to do, to surrender your life, to surrender your kingdom, to surrender the authority, the leadership of your life to God. Remember, you're not surrendering to a despot you're not surrendering to some leader who's, you know, half crazy, who's this dictator. You're surrendering to the loving Father. The, you're surrendering to the, the loving leadership of God that was demonstrated on the cross. God loves us so much, he sent his son to die for us. That's the leader you're surrendering to. And then as Matthew says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Then you surrender your will. You surrender your will to God's trustworthy leadership. See, friends, I'm not trustworthy. Oh, good, no one left. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I'm not. You're not trustworthy. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you're not. But God is is perfect in his faithfulness. He is perfect in his trustworthiness. You can surrender your heart and your will to this loving, trustworthy leader. And then the next phrase is, Jesus says, give us this day. Our daily bread, that prompts me to say, this is the third thing I surrender. I surrender my day. Many of you know that for years I have gotten on my knees. I roll out of bed every morning. I I did it this morning. I rolled out out of my bed, landed on my knees, and I said, Lord, today, today, I want to love you. I want to love people. I want to, I want to live surrendered. This is not an abstract thing. This is not theory. Today, I want to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I, I, I want to love people like Christ loved them. And I, and I want to I live a not my will, but yours be done. I want to live a, a your kingdom come, your will be done life. Lord, today I want to love you, love people, live sin, and I get up off my knees and I walk into my day. Surrender your day to the sovereign leadership of God, the, the God who can design the day, who can bring things through the day, who can bring people in your life, who can orchestrate things in such a way that he can answer that prayer 
that you are, you're praying. Surrender. The prayer that Jesus teaches us is a great way for us to learn to live surrender. Now, let me finish it up by doing this. Look back at your text again. And I've already kind of spilled in, but look, do you see the shift between verse 2 and verse 3? Got your Bibles open, right? See the, the shift between verse 2, which is about God, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And then in verse 3, and three, verse 3 and 4, a shift happens. And now, watch the screen. I'll put it on the screen for you. I highlighted in yellow. And now it turns into a bunch of us's and we's and ours. <laughs> when I lived in Philadelphia, people talked in we's and ours. They would say, hey, we's going to get some ice cream after church. You want to go with us? After I got over the, how silly it was to ask me if you wanted to go get ice cream, I laughed at the we's. Who's the we's? You got a mouse in your pocket? But that's just the way they talked. We's and us's and ours. And this is, this is the way Jesus is, is teaching us to pray. It's, uh, it's no, no I, no me, no mine. It's ours, it's us, it's we. Did you notice that? Watch this. Jesus is calling us to pray plural. I like that. Pray plural. He, in the model prayer he gives us, there's no I, we, or, or me. It's no, or there's no I, me, or mine. Why? Jesus is helping us to see the orientation is that we're, we're with the family of God. We're in the church. We're with people. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. There's no such thing in the Bible as this isolated, just me and Jesus, nobody else. No, it's always a community. And so John, John says in 1 John, if you love God, then you should love people. They go together. And so this is what Jesus is teaching us. He's teaching us to pray as a way of loving people. Could be that praying for people is, is the greatest way to love people. And if you love someone, you'll pray for them. I'm going to challenge you in a couple of seconds. Not yet, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit later to love some, a very distinct group of people. Jesus is teaching us Every disciple, he said, I want to ignite love for people inside of you. So I, I built it into my prayer. So the third thing you can write down, some of you already did. <laughs> Learning to pray like Jesus helps you love people. Learning to pray like Jesus helps you love God, helps you live surrendered, it helps you to love people. Where did we get that? We got that from Jesus. I didn't make that up. Jesus is the one who taught us to love God, to love people, to live surrendered. I think he even built it into his prayer. And so he says, as you're praying for people, pray for their needs to be met. Give us this day. Give us our daily provisions. God, I trust you because you're a trustworthy leader. Give us what we need. I'm not even sure what we need, but I know you do. So give us what we need, Lord. And as I'm praying for people, I, start, I need to pray for forgiveness, right? Because you can't hang out with people very long before they sin against you or you sin against them, right? We're sinners. So Jesus builds it into the prayer. Help us to forgive people. Forgive us our sin. And Matthew says, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, Luke puts it this way, forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. This is what it means to be in community. We hurt each other. We offend each other. We sin against each other. Is there somebody in your life that you need to forgive? Is there somebody in your life that has to forgive, that needs to forgive you? And there's a tension in your relationship right now? You see how Jesus has built into this prayer this reconciliation, he wants us to be one with each other. The power that comes in the praying and in a relationship can be short-circuited when there's sin in our life. When there's unreconciliation between us and our family and our friends. Jesus built us into the prayer for a reason. It, it matters the relationships that you have with each other. Forgive one another. And if someone needs to forgive you, ask God that they'll, that they'll forgive you. Don't ignore it. Don't just say, what's the ball's in their court. Pray that they'll forgive. Jesus built it into the prayer because it's very, very significant. Pray for our needs to be met, for forgiveness. And then he, 
he wades into, who's the one that calls, that, that tempts us to, to, uh, to, to not forgive each other? Who's the one that tempts us to sin against each other? Who's the one who puts it in our mind to be selfish and self-focused? It's, it's the evil one. So Jesus prays that we're not led into temptation. And the Matthew adds, but deliver us from the evil one. Because he can wreck relationships. He can wreck a church that God's moving in as people get back into sin and focus on each other. So Jesus builds into the prayer. And, oh, no, God, I want you to protect people from the evil one. I want you to deliver them. Lead them away from temptation. Don't lead them in. So pray that. Pray for that protection because if we're right and God is starting a prayer movement in Church the Open Door for the sake of blessing the world, because that's what he does. He, he doesn't make us holy and like Jesus for our own sake, but for the sake of the world. If that's what God's doing, Satan sees it, has already seen it, and it has already begun to distract and deceive and to, to um, create dysfunction and deception and distraction and distortion in the body of Christ in order to disrupt and if possible to destroy the good work that God wants to do. Some of you are right on track with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I know in my own life this week, my wife and I had a couple of challenges and I'm like, whoa, I know where that's coming from. My sinful heart, <laughs> but also because Satan is, is trying to destroy, he's trying to divide. This is what he does. Beyond the watch, Jesus calls us to pay attention Peter actually calls him a roaring lion who prowls around seeking to devour. Now, it's interesting to me that, that this prayer that Jesus teaches us gets echoed in the, the longest prayer that we have in Scripture from Jesus. Anybody know where that's at? It's the night before he died in John 17. You want to turn with me there? John 17. Um, Jesus, I've already referred to this chapter once. This is the night before Jesus dies. He's got his disciples. He's teaching. It's the Last Supper. And he's, he prays in John 17, calls God the Holy Father. And he prays for protection from the evil one. He prays for the disciples in, in uh, verses 6 through 19. And he, he's praying for the, the followers of his, the disciples, the night before he dies. His heart is out, being poured out. You can just hear him. You can hear the, the breaking in his voice. And one of the things he prays for the disciples is that they would be protected from the evil one. One of the things he prays is that they'll be unified. One of the things he prays is that they'll know the love that God has for them and the love that he has for them. And it's all, it's all, it's all this love that Jesus has for his disciples. Actually, the night began in John 13 with Jesus getting ready to show the full extent of his love. So he washes their feet and he prays for them and serves them. This is, this is shot through with love as Jesus loves his people, his peeps, his disciples. But he changes direction. Did you ever notice this? In verse 19, and he starts not just praying for those who are walking with Christ. And so for you and I, we need to pray for those who are Christians, pray for those who are walking with Christ, pray for those who are disciples. But also pray like Jesus does in verse 20 when Jesus says, my prayer is not for them. Who's the them? Shout it out. His disciples. It's not for them alone. I pray, I love this word, also for those who will believe in me through their message. Who's that? Who's that? Exactly. Jesus is praying for us the night before he dies. Isn't that crazy? He's thinking about you. Because he's God, he can look down through the ages. I pray for all of those who will yet believe. Hear the heart of God beating in the heart of Jesus. He's not just praying for those around him. He's praying for future disciples. And if we are going to be anything like Jesus, we can't just pray for each other. We're going to start praying for future disciples. We need to pray for those who are yet to come. Hear the heart of Jesus here. Don't miss this. 
the night before he dies, when he's facing the cross, this is what Jesus is thinking about. He's thinking about those who hate him, those who are rebelling against him, those who will crucify him. He says, Father, forgive them. They have, they have no idea what they're doing. If you are a rebel against God this morning, and just because you're in church doesn't mean you're not a rebel. If you're a rebel this morning against God, he sees you and he loves you like crazy. And he's been loving you. And he's drawing you to himself. And if you're here today and you've surrendered, you've laid down your rebellion and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then God wants you to, to stop living for yourself. I'm so happy to be saved. And start developing a heart for others and noticing your neighbors, the people you work with, the people that you work, work out with, they're lost. Do you even notice them? Jesus is thinking about them the, day, the night before he dies. And he's praying for those who are yet to believe. I want us to have that heart to pray for people who, who don't know Jesus. This is one of the ways that we'll know that we're becoming like Christ that our heart beats, our heart breaks for those who are lost. I want to ignite this kind of praying in us. So ushers, all over the, wherever you're, if you're an usher, would you get up and walk out right now? Because you're going to come back in and do something for us. But our ushers in all of our venues are going to go out and they're going to come back in in a couple of seconds and they're going to hand out little pieces of paper that have ignite on them. On one side, the other side is going to be a prayer, a little, a, a, actually a little direction that says, you know, write down on this little piece of paper the name, pay attention to me, the name or names of someone you know doesn't know Christ. There's lots of things you could write down, but today I want everyone to write down the name of someone that you know that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And maybe one or two names, I don't know. But as these little pieces of paper get passed out, and every single one of you will get one, write their name down, and then I'm going to ask you to roll it up real tight, and I'll explain why I want you to roll it. I don't want you to smoke it. I want you to roll it up. Some of you are like, what? Yeah, trust me. When I say roll, that's what some people think. I want you to write their name down, and so ushers, if you'll come, start passing these out. Um, uh, then write their name down, and, and we're going to have you put them in a prayer wall. Some of you, when you walked in today, you saw this big wooden wall. Uh, it's a prayer wall. When I was in, uh, every year I go to Jerusalem, and in, uh, every year I go, I go to what's called the Western Wall. Some people call it the Wailing Wall. Come on, ushers. Come on down. Uh, some call it the Wailing Wall. And uh, w what people do is they, they pray at this wall, and they write down prayers, and they fold them up, and they, they stick them in the cracks of these massive stones in the wall that's become a prayer wall. And you can go there 24-7. I was actually looking at it yesterday. There's a camera that, that looks, that broadcasts the, the, the Western Wall in Jerusalem 24 hours a day. And I go there every once in a while just to watch it and watch people pray. And there's all these people praying there um, and putting their prayers in the cracks of this wall. And they're, they're presenting their requests to God. This is what they're doing which is exactly what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Ushers, would you please come down? <laughs> They're having a party or smoking back there. I don't know. Please come down. Ushers, please. Start handing out these pieces of paper. Um, and so Philippians chapter 4, thank you. Verse 6, Paul says, present your requests to God. Quote, that's what we're going to do today. And the biggest request I want to be in our hearts today is the request for people who don't know God to come to know him. Are you with me? Are you with me? There's lots of things you could write on these pieces of paper. Today, would you write the name of someone that God loves Listen, everybody listen to me for a second. Listen to this phrase. The name of someone God misses. Let that sink in for a second. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That all should come into relationship. And you know people that I don't know. 
God put people's names on people's hearts that they would write down these names and begin to pray. And today, as you leave the service, as you roll that up, I want you to find that prayer wall. There's in the back of the RNC. They're in the back of the, uh, they're in that foyer in the Avon Lake in Vermilion and in the auditorium here. Roll it up tight and you'll see when you come up to the wall, you just put it right in there and leave it there. And as you do it, why don't you say this? Say, Lord, I present my request to you. These prayers are not meant for us to read each other's. This is your act of presenting to God. Your act of presenting your prayer. Here's what God's going to start doing. As you begin to pray for this person, and don't just pray today. As you begin to pray for this person, God's going to stir deeper love. Here's, some of you, something strange is going to happen to you. I'm warning you right now. This may not happen to all of us. But some of you, when you take this seriously, and you ask God to ignite love for you, for, for, for other people in your heart, you're going to find your prayers taking on new passion. Some of you are going to cry as you're praying because you're going to get the heart of God. You're going to learn that God's heart breaks. Oh, church, we are so selfish. God hearts, God's heart breaks for those who are lost. And he wants our heart to break for them. And that's why you work with them. That's why you live with them. That's why you see them in the neighborhood. Because he's put them there so you might pray for them. And then, we, and then would you do one more thing else for me? In addition to, you know, rolling this, putting their name on there, rolling up, put it, and presenting it to God and then praying for them, would you also invite that person to Easter service in three weeks? That person you're praying for for the next three weeks, would you invite them? And as you pray for them, ask God to open their hearts so they'll be receptive to your invitation. Will you do this? Remember, you got two cards today. One was in your bulletin that you're, you're supposed to, to give away. This one right here. You're not supposed to keep. Don't roll this one up. <laughs> this is the one you're going to give to your neighbor, the person you work with. This is the one you're going to put their name on, roll it up, and put it in the prayer wall. We're clear. And God will ignite love for him and love for people. It's the last thing to write down. Some of you thought, I forgot that. You're going to leave freaking out because you didn't fill out the last blank. We're, we're cool. Okay, we got it. We got it. When you learn to pray like Jesus, he ignites in you. Oh, God, this is my prayer. That you will ignite in us love for you. And love for people. Burn in our hearts love for people. God, build your church Set your church on fire with love for our world. God, build your kingdom through us. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.